All right, welcome to the show, Joanna and Karina. Thanks for coming on. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. So I think the way we want to start this is, Karina, let's start with you, because that's how uh, Vista and originated was from your story. So if you could please talk to our listeners about how, how this all unfolded and where we're at, how we got to where we're at today with you. Absolutely. So, yeah, my name is Karina and I am definitely an alcoholic. And I think that to really understand my story, it, it really just comes down to, to who I am. And I've heard stories about, you know, people whose drinking started gradually and they, you know, really started having a problem a little bit later on in their lives. And for me, that was definitely not the case. And I think it was pretty clear from a relatively young age that I had a highly addictive personality. And uh, I'd like to tell this story that's funny in retrospect, but it also just paints such a very clear picture that I used to wake up in the middle of the night as like a six or seven year old girl and I would sneak into the kitchen and I would, you know, move the stools around and climb up to the candy bin and I would raid the candy basket in the pantry and I would just eat, who knows, like dozens of candy wrappers. And I knew that if I threw the candy wrappers in the trash, that the next morning my mom would find them and I get grilled about it immediately. So what I would do is I would take these candy wrappers and I'd stuff them under the couch cushions or I'd put them behind the TV center and the console. And eventually it was bound to happen that we'd do some spring cleaning or something and these hundreds of candy wrappers <laughs> would pop out of nowhere. But you know, that was, if you fast forward 15 years, that was, that was me with my alcohol bottles in the suitcases and under the bed and in my closet. And it just really, that was kind of how I rolled. And once I got started with something, it was really, really difficult for me to stop. And that was the case with food. That was the case with attention seeking behaviors. And as I got older, it was definitely the case with alcohol. And I vividly remember the first night that I drank, we were on vacation and my sister, who is a couple of weeks older than me, were stepsisters. She and I snuck out of our little apartment condo and we met up with some boys that we had met. And I remember they gave us these big red solo cups that were for mixed drinks, but I don't drink soda and I never did. So I was like, can you just give me everything without the soda? So they made me a mixed drink of, I don't even remember rum or vodka or something, but just like straight alcohol. And I remember drinking it. And at one point I turned to my sister and like, I can't even feel it anymore. She said, I think <laughs> that means you should stop. And that's one of the last things that I remember. And I was uh, very, very sick. I blacked out. I vomited all throughout the next day. And even as I was vomiting, all I could think about was I can't wait to do that again. And it was like this freedom of I felt attractive. I felt funny. I felt wanted and free from my own self-criticisms is what I really think it came down to. And that feeling had been so elusive for me that it was all I could think about. And so all throughout high school, I was able to maintain, I guess what you would call functioning. Like I wasn't a full-blown alcoholic at that point. I wasn't drinking every day or even every week, but whenever I was at a party or in some type of situation where alcohol or other substances were available to me, I always took too much. And um, for a long time, I would get sick every single time I drank. And it really, really got out of control once I went off to college and I didn't have that type of parental support or accountability or whatever you might wanna call it. Suddenly it was okay to drink every single day and everybody else was drinking every single day. And I managed to attract the type of people who liked to party the way that I liked to. And it really got out of control for me very, very quickly. And I think, you know, there's, there's definitely this idea of a functional alcoholic. And in some ways it's very much a blessing that that was not me because it wasn't. I, I pretty much drank to blackout levels every single time that I drank. And it was by my beginning of my sophomore year of college, I was taking shots in the morning before I went to my classes. 
and getting to a point where I was passing out by three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon when the rest of my roommates were just getting started. And, um, you know, it, it was a pretty miserable life, but I was able to convince myself that I was in college and I was still having fun. And that all was well and good until I started failing my classes because, you know, getting drunk like that is not very conducive to the types of grades that I was getting in high school. And so I started failing and being the manipulative person that I am, I figured out, hey, I can tell my parents that I have mono. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't an outright lie. Like most of the best lies, there was an element of truth to it. One of my roommates had gotten sick with mono a few months earlier, which I think planted the idea. So I spun this story and told them I'm so sick. I can't go to my classes. I have to drop out for the semester. And they believed me and they, you know. Wait my a mom, minute. This is the first time I'm hearing you didn't <laughs> test positive for mono. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, the beauty of mono is that you, you either test positive for it or you don't and it's not time sensitive so I did test positive for mono but I was not I don't think sick with mono when I said that I was Uh, so yes (laughs) sorry mom flew her across country you know I was so worried about my little baby (laughs) Well, she was sick, but (laughs) she did. She she flew me across uh, to Annapolis where they had moved when I was in college. And I thought that I was getting this type of free pass and of course felt a little bit guilty for tricking them. But I was more excited about, you know, being able to continue this lifestyle that I had created that I thought was making me very happy. But uh, that little lie ended up being the demise of of my so-called freedom because when I was in Annapolis recovering, and I use that with air quotes, right? Um, <laughs> it became very, very clear that I had a problem and I was pretty much drinking now every single day at home and had developed such a tolerance to it that it wasn't obvious to my parents that I was drunk when I was blackout drunk. And one day I was blacked out and I asked to borrow the car to go buy more alcohol, but I told them I was going grocery shopping and my mom didn't even realize I'd been drinking. And I was heading back from the liquor store and there's a really, really sharp curve heading into their house. It's um, you know leading right next to the highway. So there's one of those big concrete dividers. And I guess, I, I, I don't know, but I didn't turn. And I smashed into that concrete divider so badly that uh, my, I was catapulted across the passenger side. My skull shattered the window. Um, the entire car was completely totaled and I was flight for life to the Baltimore hospital. And I remember coming to in the hospital, with my mom standing over me in just tears. And I knew in the back of my head what had happened. And that was the start of what ended up becoming a six year cycle of going to treatment and getting out and failing to work a program and um, ultimately relapsing. And there were, you know, multiple court hearings and car accidents. And it was, it was a really disastrous cycle for me. And I was extremely fortunate in that um, I had incredible parents who loved me and didn't give up on me and had the financial resources to help me in those points when I, when it was really bleak and I needed it. And I was able to attend three incredible treatment centers. I really do think that every single one taught me something absolutely important out of every single one of them. And I think for me, the biggest takeaway was that the first time I went to treatment right after that accident, I was 19 years old. And the thought of never having a drink or a drug again for the rest of my life when that was literally the only thing that I had found up until that point that made me feel like a whole person that made me feel the way that I thought that I was supposed to feel was absolutely terrifying to me and so I think that probably one of the biggest gifts that I received right from the get-go was by being around other people my age because the first one that I went to was a youth uh, treatment center and so I was with a lot of other young women that were under the age of 25 and to hear these stories that sounded so much like my stories and to see myself reflected in their eyes it really helped me feel like okay maybe I'm not alone here and that was the first time that I really opened my heart up to the idea of okay 
I think I'm an alcoholic. And, you know, as anyone knows, that's the most pivotal step that anyone can take in this journey to recovery is, is fully admitting to themselves that they are an alcoholic and that, you know, they're, they're powerless over their addiction. And that was something that had been so terrifying to me that I was so hesitant to cross that boundary. But when I finally saw other people who looked like me, sounded like me, had these experiences like I did, who were also realizing, okay, well, you know, I want to live, I want to have a life. And that really helped me kind of turn the tables and, and shift where I was at because before then it had been, no, 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 I'm not an alcoholic. I like to party. Yes. Like I'm a party girl for sure. I'll own that night and day, but okay, maybe I have a problem, but I can still live. Like, I'm not like you. I can still find a way to make this work for me. I just need to figure out how I can drink responsibly. I just need to figure that, that whole thing out, but I will, I will. And you know, the great thing about coming to terms with being an alcoholic is that even when I went back out again, I never lost that. And so it was like every single time I drank and wasn't able to control it, it was further research showing me that I really desperately did need help, that it wasn't something that I could do on my own. And so that was kind of a big takeaway the first time. I ended up um, putting almost six months under my belt after that first treatment center, started going back to college, and then I did ultimately relapse again. And I hadn't quite figured out that I needed to work the steps the way that, that, they, were, that they were written, right? Again, it was, I was a victim of my own projected intelligence. I thought that I could find a, a way around it, just like I had manipulated my mom into thinking that I had mono, just like I had manipulated my teachers into letting me pass, just like I had manipulated everyone in my life. I thought that I could find a way to manipulate the steps or manipulate this disease to make it so that it was personalized for me and reflective of what I wanted, which was ultimately to maybe smoke pot and just not drink or to just drink on the weekends or something like that. It was this constant experiment that I had that kept failing over and over again, no matter how many different ways that I tried it. And I really am so grateful for the experiences that I had at each treatment center and particularly the last one that I went to is this place called The Refuge in Ocala, Florida. And it was located on I don't know, hundreds of acres or I don't know, it was, it was a lot of land that we got to explore. And, and we lived in these little cabins and had group time. And I stayed there for three and a half months, which was a little bit longer than their typical three month suggested stay. And it was a trauma-based treatment center, which meant that we focused a lot on trauma, obviously. And to me, that was something that I almost didn't even want to, similar to not wanting to admit that I was an alcoholic, I had a really hard time admitting that I had trauma. And I think a lot of that was due to the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the traumatic situations in my life were due directly to my drinking, as you might imagine, as a, you know, college girl who's getting blacked out every single night. And also some things from my childhood, which when you look back and, you know, I would say, and I would still say today that I had an incredible childhood, but there were also very real traumatic experiences that I had as a child that I tried to kind of stuff under the rug because I didn't want to put blame anywhere. I didn't want to think of myself as damaged or anything like that. But there were some, there were some things that I really needed to work through that had I not spent the time and energy to really dedicate myself and work through, I don't think I ever would have been able to actually stay sober uh, long-term. And shortly after that, um, that treatment center, I came down to South Florida and I found a halfway house and uh, you know started really getting involved in AA. And it was an incredible recovery scene here in South Florida eight or nine years ago, it still is. But back then walking down the streets of Delray Beach, it was like every second person that you saw was in the rooms. And it was just this incredible feeling of community. I'm sorry, Amazon, okay. the daily Amazon delivery. Um, <laughs> It was, it was this incredible feeling of camaraderie and I loved it. And I started working the steps. I started doing the deal. And for the first time, I really kind of gave myself up to the program, the way that it was designed to be written. And, um, you know, at, at that time, I also decided, okay, I've graduated now. That's somehow I managed to graduate in between those six years of blackness. I don't quite know how with a lot of support from my parents for sure, but I managed to graduate. So now I've graduated and I finally have a couple of months of sobriety under my belt. So it's time to get to work. And I got, I ended up getting two part-time jobs. I was biking over 10 miles a day to get to them. And so I was working from like 7am until about eight or nine o'clock PM every single night. And 
the more that I pushed myself into that, the less and less time I had for meetings. And I pretty quickly started getting to a point where I was falling out of my meetings. I was falling out of my meetings with sponsors and sponsees. And I just, I, I kind of forgot. And that forgetter is very strong with me, I've learned. And it wasn't very long after I stopped going to meetings on a regular basis that that, um, that creeping voice came back again and I started drinking again. And it was a very rapid, very short, very intense relapse. What I noticed over the years is that my relapses got shorter and shorter, but they got increasingly more intense. And so by the last relapse, I think it lasted about a month and a half. And I was so completely broken by the end of it. My, um, my boyfriend at the time dropped me off at the hospital. I had a BAC of 0.46, which sounds like almost impossible to believe. Uh, but my mom can attest to the fact that that's true. And, and he called her, she flew down to the hospital. And so I'm sitting there in the hospital bed. And I just remember feeling like, what's the point? And, you know, in the big book, it talks about the people that are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And I honestly thought, maybe that's me. And maybe I'm so broken that there's no help for me, that there's no help in the program. There's no help in the treatment centers. There's no help in the world for someone as, you know, constitutionally incapable of healing as I am. And, and I was very broken. Unfortunately, she again didn't give up on me. And what we realized was that I was very good at being in treatment. I was always like the star pupil in the treatment centers. And I was really good at being sober in treatment. And like I said, I got so much out of all of my experiences, but I also wasn't so good at life. Like I was really good at being a sober treatment person, I wasn't so good at being a sober member of society. And so mm -hmm. what we realized was that we should focus more on getting me into some really long-term halfway house help and really dedicating myself to AA. And that's what I did. So we found a halfway house in Delray Beach that allowed dogs because that had always been my biggest reason to leave treatment or my biggest reason to leave the halfway yeah. house is my dog, right? Like I I can't live without my dog. So we found a place that allowed dogs and I, um, you know, I moved in and she was great. There was a lot of flexibility. It was this little house where, um, you know, the woman lived with us and it was, you know, it was an interesting dynamic. It was different than any other sober house I'd ever lived in, but it worked for me. And what happened, what was different this time was that I knew that this was my last shot. I, I truly believed lying on that hospital bed that I had one more shot. Um, and I was, I was a few months away from being 25 years old and I realized that I actually wanted to live and I actually did want to give myself that opportunity to, to have a life um, and to have a future. And so I threw myself into it more than I ever had before. I was going to one, at least if not more than one meeting every single day, I immediately got a sponsor and started working the steps like full blown. My fourth step was entirely honest. I went through everything and I really did the deal. And because I was so sure that the end was near and that I probably wouldn't survive another relapse. And because I was so sure that this program probably isn't going to work for me anyways, I just actually gave up my attempts to manipulate it, gave up my attempts to personalize it and just did it the way that it was written in the big book and the way that my sponsor walked me through it within a very short period of time, like I'm talking a month and a half, that constant obsession was lifted. And I, I used to try to explain the desire to drink to people that didn't understand it as like an itch that's constantly itching you like crazy and you can't scratch it. And so you can, you know, you can not scratch it, but it's still going to itch. And the only way to relieve the itch is to itch it, but it just makes it itch more. And for the first time ever, that itch was alleviated and it was, it was slow at first, right? It would be like a couple of hours that I wouldn't think about drinking and then it would come back. But in those couple of hours, I started to realize that it was possible to, to go a few hours without drinking, which was something that hadn't, I hadn't experienced since I first had my first drink at 14 years old. And that time got longer and longer before you knew it. Like I was living this beautiful, wonderful life surrounded by beautiful, wonderful people. And I was happy. And I felt like that desirable, wonderful, special person that I felt like when I was drinking, in the beginning at least, when I was sober. And my life completely changed. And it was amazing because I got to this place where I finally had given myself up. And I was like, all right, God, I, 
I get it. Like, I trust in you. I, my, your will, not mine be done. I trust you. And then I got pregnant. And that was a real quick way of bringing me back to my fears and, oh my God, oh my God, I can't do this. Wait, God, wait. Like I, I wasn't, I didn't mean that. Right. Yeah. Um, but that ended up being, that ended up being the best gift of my entire life. And, um, you know, I, I've been sober for eight years now. I have a wonderful life. My husband is, uh, you know, my, my daughter's father. We ended up staying together. We have another beautiful little girl who's about 10 months old. I have an incredible career. I have an incredible relationship with my family. I have a relationship with God and I have a relationship with myself. And, um, you know, there, there have been times over the past eight years which have been more difficult than others. I'll definitely say that um, staying sober in the pandemic when there weren't, you know, meetings available and things like that was, was incredibly challenging. Um, but I am so happy and so grateful to live this beautiful life that I have today. And I'm so grateful to my mom and to the incredible treatment centers, the incredible sponsors, the incredible meeting houses that have all played such an integral role in my sobriety and bringing me to where, that I, where I am today because I actually love who I am today and I love the life that I've built. And I, it just, it still brings tears to my eyes. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here on this podcast today because it, it really is so easy living this life that looks like a normal life on the outside. It's so important to take a step back and remember that like in my heart of hearts, I still am very much the same person. I'm still an alcoholic, but you can be an alcoholic and have a beautiful, wonderful life. And um, yeah, that's me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I've heard so many stories, but they never get old. Like I always, it's always hits just as hard every single time, you know? And uh, yeah, like what Angie said, I appreciate you sharing that story. I think there's a million things I can relate to in your story. I think there's probably a million things Angie could relate to in your story. And, you know, I just, I... I, I always love like looking back or like listening to someone tell their story, looking back at it because there's so much like wisdom peppered into what was really happening. And again, I thought I could just run my own program and that didn't work. Like I love the commentary because it's, it's like, that's the humorous part. Like back then we had no idea that we were trying to run our own program. We just thought we still could get away with who we were and what we were doing. So I just wanted to comment on that because that part always makes me laugh so hard. Like where we were at, where we thought we were at that part. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you can tell you've done so much work, you know, the, the, the way you tell the story in, in retrospects and you can tell there's been a lot of work and realizations and you've, you've, you've actually put in the time and dug deep and, and gotten, and that's why you're doing so well today because it really takes being completely vulnerable and confronting all those uh, bad deeds and a lot of people run from that because it is really difficult to contend with the things that we've done or have been done to us. Well, so. one of one of my favorite things to to discuss with the sponsor year if I'm leaving a meeting or something like that is that part in the big book where it talks about how of those of us who have really tried, 50% of us stay sober right away. And you know, then it, it delineates even more of the percentages there. And I always used to look at that in total disbelief and be like, I don't know anyone that's got a 50%, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it was just, it, it seems like there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of relapses of part of the story a lot of the times. And that's when I kind of yeah. had to step back and realize, well, how many of those relapse times was I really trying? like none of them. When I really tried, when I really did the work, when I really did what, you know, the treatment center suggested or really did what my sponsor told me to do, my success rate was suddenly a lot higher. So. Yeah, no, that's, and that's a perfect kind of segue too, right? Into the numbers of kind of where all of this, you know, the podcast and your mom and the whole story kind of intertwines as, you know, someone with experience in treatment you meet 60 people there maybe. And you're like, how are only four of us sober? How did five pass away? Like you start to really kind of see on a bigger scale what's really happening where, where stories like yours are, are actually not that common. 
right? In, in my experience, it's actually not that common that people stay sober and live this great life, or at least on the first try or the second try. So maybe we can kind of use that as a segue and where your mother comes in and Vista and, and, and kind of where we're at now. Yeah. So Joanna, where would you like to pick up? Uh, Joanna is mother <laughs> and Vista <laughs> and all that. Uh, in this story, well, we saw the surprise today about the mono, which <laughs> 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 what other surprises were in there? <laughs> <laughs> there were a few others, but that was the biggest one. <laughs> She's never heard me share my story before, actually. Oh, so. wow. Well, what a beautiful moment. <laughs> You know, probably not that same way. And, and first of all, I have to say, I am so incredibly blessed to have this wonderful daughter and to be, have her part of my family and, and have two gorgeous grandchildren. And I mean, if you had asked me eight or nine years ago, if we would be where we are today, I would have said, I really don't think it's, there's a chance of it because every time the phone would ring, I was terrified they were gonna tell me, some strange voice was gonna tell me my daughter had died. I mean, it was really, really bad and I knew it was really bad and it was really bad at a number of different points. And um, so first of all, I feel incredibly proud of Karina and all that she's been able to accomplish. And I know how difficult it was because I was there. You were there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm also really thankful to all the wonderful treatment centers that she found in the different halfway houses. And, you know, she's given, she has really given you a shorter version. I mean, there were multiple IOPs and halfway houses and a bunch of failures and a bunch of things that, you know, we had great hopes for that didn't quite pan out. Um, so where I think I'll take up the story is after it looked like the worst was behind us, and I do realize that you never know for sure. I mean, anyone in recovery could relapse tomorrow, which is part of what makes this disease so incredibly awful. Mm -hmm. But when, when I feel, realize that, you know, I think, fingers crossed, Karina's doing okay, you know, it's been a, a year, two years, maybe she's doing okay. I started to think back to some of the horrible times that we had been through. And one of the things that made me angriest was remembering the different times that I was in the ER with her. She had a, as she mentioned, multiple times, she had a very high blood alcohol level. And it was clear she was in crisis. And if I wanted my daughter to survive, we needed to find treatment for her immediately. And I would have to try and figure out, you know, where, where should we look to send her to treatment? And it was a total crapshoot. Each mm -hmm. time I was forced to rely on a chance comment that somebody made. I remember one time a neighbor had said to me at a picnic six months earlier, you know, if you ever need treatment again, I've heard the refuge is a really good place, right? Somehow I would remember that type of comment or somebody else would mention, you should check out this place or that place. And I'd call them up and explain the situation and they were always so nice. I mean, admissions counselors, they're, they're, they are wonderful, caring people, but they're salespeople. And, you know, they would always sound, the place was always perfect, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd say, great, well, what is your success rate? And they would invariably say, oh, trust me, we're one of the best. And I'm thinking, addiction treatment is healthcare, right? And so when I'm looking back on it years later, I said, I feel like we've been incredibly blessed and I want to find a way to help the parents coming behind us. So just as a labor of love, I decided to create a website called Conquer Addiction, where uh, families looking for treatment 
could search and could find treatment centers with validated proven success rates. So I did that as a side project and um, uh, was horrified to discover that there were only five treatment centers in the entire country who were monitoring their outcomes. In other words, following up with patients after treatment and were willing to share the results with me and publicly. Five wow. treatment centers. There's something like 14,000 treatment centers in the US, five of them were- That was my next question. Out of how many? Yeah, yeah 14,000, that's a terrible percentage. Right. And, and of course, a lot of those are mental health only or something. I don't really think there's 14,000 that are doing good addiction treatment work, but that's the number that SAMHSA will tell you. So anyway, I thought, well, I can't start to promote this website that only recommends five treatment centers. So I almost gave up. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to take this one step further. And I went to, uh, started going to some conferences and talking to the owners of treatment centers. Um, and I said, um, do you hear like a, a real noise in the background? No. No? Okay, good. Just your um, voice. Okay, because my husband is running a blender downstairs. So anyway. No, we chop, can't hear it. Chop that part out. <laughs> Okay. okay. You don't them down below my feet. We're fine. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, where was I? So I almost gave up. And then I thought, I'm going to try just a little bit more. And I went to an addiction treatment conference and I started talking to treatment center owners. And I said, I don't understand it. Parents want to know whether your treatment is effective or not. Why aren't you monitoring your true success rates. And enough of them said they wanted to, that it was in the next year's strategic plan, but they didn't know how to do it. And I thought, there's a business opportunity here. And I have a very odd background. I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher. Um, I've started international nonprofits. I've run for Congress of all things. <laughs> But one of, <laughs> one of the things I did along the line was I taught myself how to program and I spent five years running a software company. So I could look at the challenges of how would you systematically and cost effectively follow up with patients after addiction treatment to see how they're doing. And I thought, this isn't rocket science. We can figure out how to do it. So again, as a side project, I was running another company at the time. I said, I'm going to start a research company to see if we can convince some uh, treatment centers to monitor their outcomes. So I did that in the uh, September of 2015, and we started offering uh, outcomes research and uh, the ability to monitor patients while they're in treatment uh, so that their clinicians can help them get better faster. We've been offering that to a growing number of treatment centers since uh, March of 2016. So as of now, we've monitored over 50,000 patients in addiction treatment and followed up with um, uh, 13,000 or so after treatment. I'm just going to cut in right there and just say I uh, I appreciate what you do because back back in the day, so maybe 10, 15 years ago, we wanted to do uh, official third party outcome studies, but the only way to get that done was through a college for an exorbitant amount of money, like $100,000, and it'd have to be a three year study and a double blind, and it was like so crazy just to try to get an independent study that um, I know for ourselves, that's why we didn't have any studies except what our own internal tracking, which we did, and we've always followed up and kept our own success rate. But there was nobody like you around that could that could actually help with this. You know, it's really mind boggling to me, but to me, it was so apparent this was necessary. And yet, sometimes some people will push back and say, you know, 
what do you know about this? You know, and, and mm -hmm. it turns out, you know, five and a half years ago, I didn't know anything about it. Now I know a tremendous amount about it because we have all of the research data that exists. But one of the things that I thought was so upsetting was when I started looking into addiction treatment outcomes and I was going through all the research literature, I discovered that the last major outcomes research that was done, the last research of, of outcomes for a, a lot of different treatment centers was a federally funded study that was done in 1993. Yeah. Think about it. 27 years between then and now, and no one had done a follow-up study to see how outcomes of addiction treatment were trending. And to, me, to me, it's just mind boggling. This is healthcare. And if you think about how cancer is treated, for example, you know, you have doctors, they'll try all sorts of different types of treatment, and then they will follow up with those patients and they will say, okay, this treatment works and that doesn't work as well. So we're going to do more of this that works well. We've never had anything like that in addiction treatment. Well, and the, the frequent kind of kickbacks that I oftentimes heard was that you can't do it for addiction treatment because so much of it is up to the addict or the alcoholic, that it's really kind of, right. out, of out of the treatment center's hands at that point. But if you think about cancer to a certain degree, but certainly to you know heart disease, to all these other healthcare issues, there is a huge amount of variance depending on lifestyle factors and, and depending on the patient's willingness to adhere to the suggestions by the doctor and things like that. So to me, while you know certainly there is that that level of personal responsibility, no doubt about it, there also are very clearly treatment centers that have very effective treatment plans and outcomes, and then those that do not. Well, and I think that's probably a lot of uh, the resistance are treatment centers that don't have great outcomes. Why would they pay for an independent study when they're not trusting their own products at the end of the day? So I'm sure there's a lot of resistance there. And because like Joanna, you touched on, there's no accountability. They're not held to any standards. So why would they voluntarily sign up for something like that? Right. And what we found is that the treatment centers that have um, contracted with VISTA to do this outcomes research, they're invariably run by somebody who really cares deeply about mm -hmm. the mission of their center, that this is not about making money or, you know, that's certainly not the most important thing. This is their way to help other people. Yeah. A lot of the people who started treatment centers are in recovery themselves. And so what we found was that it's, it's been so far in the five years we've been doing this, it's predominantly those centers that are really mission driven that have mm -hmm. said, I want to track our outcomes. And what's been one of the many things that's been fascinating about this is that we see a tremendous range of treatment effectiveness. Realize that everyone who has paid to have us track their outcomes truly believes in their heart of heart that their treatment is more effective than average. And yet, of course, that's not possible. And what we see is that the percentage of patients that we can reach who tell us they're not using, they're not drinking or using drugs one year after treatment ranges between 19% and 50%. That's a tremendous range. And yet yeah. every single one of those treatment centers believes that they're really effective. And the most exciting thing and the thing that gives me the hope for the future is that we have found that among treatment centers that stick with it, when we give them those results, they look at it and say, we're going to get even better, even though of course, some of them look at it and say, 
I don't like that result. And gosh, I'm paying for this. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and, and then they, they find a reason, you know, to, to stop, stop measuring. Um, right. But the ones that look at the results and say, you know, okay, that's where we are. And we want to get even better because there's always room for getting better. What we found is that those treatment centers who stick with it have dramatically better outcomes their second year. So what we found is of 17 different treatment centers that have done outcomes research for multiple years, 14 of the 17 had better outcomes the second year, that's 82%. And on average, across all 17 of the treatment centers, 20% more patients were in recovery six months later across all 17 of the treatment centers that were monitoring their outcomes for multiple years. So yes, addiction treatment is an art as much as a science, but the fact is this is an inexpensive, relatively easy way to dramatically improve outcomes. Of those 17 centers, the average treatment center spent $27,000 a year on research. That's it. They might charge more than that for one person to come into mm -hmm. treatment. So it's not outrageously expensive and it will dramatically improve outcomes. Agreed. I mean, and we've found that it is a very useful tool. We work with you a lot. You know, you, you show us the results. Hey, you guys are slipping in this area or have you looked at that? And uh, we find that it's been incredibly beneficial. Um, and, and we don't mind getting feedback or direction. Like, you know, there's a, we don't have the arrogance. I think perhaps that maybe other rehabs will get like, we're the best and how can you tell us what to do? You're not a rehab. So I think there has to be a willingness too on the rehab to continue to grow and change and, you know, find and be accountable for what maybe not is working anymore. Maybe it used to work, maybe it doesn't work now and just keep improving. And I think that's how you survive anything in this world is continuing to, change and adapt and, and pivot when needed. Well, Elevate was uh, one of those treatment centers I was thinking about when I said they're really, you know, run by a, a group or a small number of people who are deeply committed to helping more patients recover. And uh, we've been working with Elevate for three years now, and your outcomes are wonderful. In fact, uh, Elevate Addiction Center was the uh, Conquer Addiction Excellence in Treatment gold winner last year. In other words, of all the treatment centers that you know, uh, were doing outcomes and submitting them to Conquer Addiction, it, was, it had the highest outcomes of all of them, the most number of patients in recovery. So my hat is off to you, whatever you're doing, you're doing it really well. <laughs> <laughs> we, we think so. Of course, we're in that one where we think we're the best for sure. But, uh, yeah, but, but I you think have you some know, data. <laughs> yeah, you can back it up. Back yes, up. we have the results to back it. <laughs> Joanna, walk us through the process because I don't think people understand like it's not you're not just talking to the clients after they leave treatment this starts um, from the second they come into treatment and you're you, you're building that relationship so they're more willing to talk to you but you can also see the changes as they're going through the program as well correct. Yes. So what we do is uh, we start out uh, with, uh, and everything we do, by the way, is patient reported online. So they can do it on a cell phone or an iPad or whatever. And when they first come into treatment, they take an intake uh, survey where we get all sorts of information about what's their primary drug of choice? How much were they using? What's their addiction severity? We screen them for all sorts of different co-occurring disorders like depression and anxiety and PTSD that we know are directly related to your success being able to stay sober. And we start and we get a lot of quality of life information. Where are they living? Are they working? How long have they been using problematically? 
that sort of thing. So we get a lot of information at the beginning. And then what we do is we have them uh, take quick update surveys at least once a week. And it, it can be even more frequently than that where we get an update on their levels of depression or trauma or whatever their personal issues are. And we report those results instantly to their clinicians because this, this type of work, what this is called progress monitoring, we're monitoring the progress the patients make during treatment. It has been proven that when clinicians have the ability to see how the patient themselves reports their feeling, that patients get better faster. And so this has been as, uh, academically proven in uh, a meta-analysis of 45 different clinical trials. And it's, it's um, become now the gold standard that uh, any treatment centers who are accredited by the Joint Commission have to be doing something like this. So we're monitoring the patients throughout the time they're in treatment. And then we will follow up with the patients once they leave treatment at one month, six months, and 12 months post-treatment. And we'll follow up, we'll call, them, we'll call them, we'll email them, we'll text them, uh, we'll pay them a little bit to take the survey. We can instantly send them a Target or a Starbucks gift card once they've completed their outcome survey. And what we're looking for at each of those time periods, one, six, and 12 months is, you know, how are you doing? Are you using um, drugs or alcohol? And if so, what are you using and how much? And how are you feeling? We know what different disorders they were wrestling with, what different mental health issues. You know, we know you were depressed when you came into treatment. How, how is your depression now? So we'll get an update on all of these things. And then, um, and everything they tell us after treatment, by the way, is confidential. So that they can tell us that they're back drinking again or using heroin or whatever knowing it would get back, if it got back to their clinician, that clinician would be devastated. They can tell us, and it's, it's totally secret. All we do is we, we aggregate all of this data and we report, you know, um, uh, 40 out of 100 of your patients were reachable and abstinent. So we will ask if somebody admits in a survey that they are using again, we will ask at the end of the survey, would you like someone from your treatment center to contact you to possibly discuss returning to treatment? And a significant percentage of the patients do say yes. And in fact, I remember I was, I very rarely do these phone interviews and most of them are done, you know, as I said, on a cell phone or something. But one time late at night, none of our researchers were available and we got a call from a, a young man. He had to be early twenties and it was loud in the background. There's a party going on. And I say, uh, you know, I'm going down the questionnaire, when, uh, you know, have you used any of these things? Well, of course. And, and he, you know, have you cocaine recently um, yeah, and, and minutes ago and he was calling us for the five dollar gift card right that and i'm i'm sitting there and it's you know late at night and i'm thinking i have other things to do this guy is you know there's no way he's going to be interested in returning to treatment we go through the whole survey and i almost didn't ask researcher you know following the rules i almost didn't ask would you like someone from your treatment center to contact you to possibly discuss going back into treatment and i did I asked the question and there was a long pause. And he said, you know, I think I do. Wow. So we could immediately reach out to the treatment center because we instantly notify someone in their admissions department to say, you know, you should reach out to this person. He really is interested in going back to treatment. That's so amazing. And so I, that's I how we do the research. Yeah, and the, that's, Go ahead, I, I love that example because it's 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 true and it's re, it's in real time and 
kind of one of the the examples I wanted to offer too from from our end as a clinician over at Elevate is we'd get a, a they do their weekly surveys and what I saw from my experience was that it made it very so they take a weekly survey on how they're feeling what they're going through are they getting enough help and and stuff like that basically the questions you kind of explained and with the results it would show us like what's what's the word it would show us objectively how they were doing and oftentimes it wasn't what the client was saying right so it it, it was almost like a two-factor authentication it was like a backup plan to like buffer out, are they telling the truth to their counselors in their groups? Because now we have these graphs or these surveys that are saying you're experiencing trauma or you're feeling depressed or you feel like you're getting worse mentally. And we could use it as a way to create more awareness or to, to help them more. Like, hey, you were saying this, but over here you were saying that, like, which is true? Either way is fine but it's so awesome to have that data. It's so awesome to have the graph, the results. Like at some point you were by yourself filling this survey out and you said these things and that's totally okay, but let's talk about it. So it created this like safety net to catch things that maybe were going under the radar for whatever the, the occasion was, but yeah. I can relate to being in treatment and not wanting to share everything right away or being like Karina and doing the best in treatment and putting on this big smile and I got this, I love this place, but then you get me all alone and I'm feeling differently. So I just, I love that that is a possibility to happen because of you guys. In real time. And it gives us the ability to handle it while they're still in treatment before they don't ever express it and they leave and then they go relapse. It's really great to get that instantaneous feedback and give us the ability to help them while we can still help them in treatment. Yeah, we hear that a lot. Uh, you know, I, I've heard a number of times uh, clinicians saying that um, for whatever reason, they didn't look at the survey results until after the, you know, they had finished up an, an appointment with their, uh, with their uh, patient. And one, one clinician was telling me one time that, um, you know, he just finished, had a good conversation with this person. And then he, he looked at the results that they had just reported and they were contemplating suicide. And he went running down the hall and he's like, we just talked for an hour. You know, <laughs> why didn't you tell me? He's like, well, it, it didn't come up. You know, well, get back in here. Let's yeah. talk, right? <laughs> so I, I think that that experience you're having, I think is very common. And, you know, a lot of people, particularly with the, the, the younger generation, I'll show my age here, you know, they're a lot more comfortable talking to the anonymous internet than they are yes. face to face. You know, they, they'll tell us on, the, on their cell phone all sorts of things that, you know, they might not, you know, admit when they have to look you in the eye. Right? And we're also, of course, systematically asking them a series of questions that are designed and, and validated for speaking in the words they would understand. We don't say, you know, do you have generalized anxiety disorder? We say, right. you, know, are, you know, are are you like, um, and, God, and now I'm going to space out on exactly what we do ask, but you know, it, it's, you know, are you feeling, you know, jittery or uncomfortable or, you know, something like that? We put it in terms that they will understand. Yeah, absolutely. And I oftentimes think, I think too, clients will, they want to be feeling better. And if, if they're telling their counselors they are, then they can believe it too. But like you said, if you're one-on-one -on -one with, for us, we use the iPad. If you're one-on-one -on -one with the iPad, you can be truthful. And kind of my segue into that is I think Vista research in your guys's company is so beautiful because it's just based on the truth and angie knows that's like this huge mission of mine is that i think this field should be based on the truth you know it, it is healthcare, and these outcomes are so important but we don't always see the truth like like you guys kind of mentioned 
the the sales rep on the admissions call and it's like we're the best well how come because i feel like we are you know I, I want you to buy this program so we are the best and this has been the best way that i've seen eliminate that and i think that's amazing like that is kind of like my big my big passion or my big purpose is to see that go away and see far more graphs and far more outcomes and far more success and far more awareness on how this field can be 10 times better and 10 times more successful. So I really appreciate you guys. Yeah. And, and more accountability, you know, you have to be held to a certain standard. You can't just throw up a building and have some meetings all day, smoke some cigarettes and say, look, we're the best. It's like, there, there <laughs> needs to be like a measuring stick or some, some guidelines that proof. actually some proof would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, and one of the other day you're talking about people's lives here and, you know, for yeah. me, certainly it was, it was life or death. And for most people that are reaching the point where they are seeking treatment, they've reached that point where, you know, where things are dire and they really need help. And I have unfortunately buried way too many people um, than I, than I care to admit. My husband lost his best friend from his entire life just a few months ago. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really, treatment centers are doing incredible work. They're saving so many lives, but especially here in Delray, um, you know, people up until just a couple of years ago, admissions counselors were getting commission based yeah. on based on people coming in and there were active body brokering going on where people were paying yeah. people to leave treatment center and to relapse so they could get readmitted and charge the insurance companies again so um you know fortunately i think a lot of that has been eliminated especially here in south florida over the past couple of years but there is this dark history to yes. rehabs that doing doing this type of work doing these types of outcomes research really does help to eliminate and to help really let the uh the cream rise to the top so to speak well and that kind of is a great segue to talk about um something that i'm really excited that karina and i have been able to do together and that is that um when covid hit uh, you know, all addiction treatment centers were, you know, suddenly uh, fo completely focused on revamping how they operate and how do they keep their patients secure and how do they provide telehealth and all that sort of thing. And I was trying to figure out, well, you know, I, I don't think this is the right time to be hassling treatment center owners about investing in research. And I realized <laughs> that um, we now had a critical mass of treatment centers who were tracking their outcomes. And so I started talking to Karina about the option of relaunching Conquer Addiction as a nonprofit where families searching for treatment could go and find treatment centers that were investing in doing outcomes research. And so we pulled together a team of an independent panel of academic experts who are our judges. And um, we launched Conquer Addiction last June. And it includes, you know, um, several dozen treatment centers across the country who are proving that they provide really excellent treatment. So a family can go to it today or someone looking for treatment them for themselves can go to it. It's conquer-addiction.org. And they can say, I'm looking for treatment in California, say, or I need residential treatment, or I need um, trauma-informed care, or I need insurance. I need a treatment center that takes this particular type of insurance whatever their needs are, and they can plug in their requirements and they will see a list of treatment centers that meet their requirements with those with the best proven outcomes on top. And they don't have to be using Vista Research Group. They're, the two companies are, you know, they're, they're totally separate. As long as they are following the standardized outcomes research process, that our judges have set, they can submit their outcomes and they can be 
uh, you know, found on conquer addiction by anyone searching for treatment in that area. Wow, that's so awesome. I love that you guys do that because I think that is, it's a, a hole that needed to be filled. And maybe Karina can relate to this, you as well. I mean, I think it's kind of uh, obvious that we can all relate to this, but I feel like me landing at Elevate was just pure chance. Kind of like you mentioned with Karina landing at the refuge was just a side comment that was given to you at one time and you happen to remember it. So we got very lucky to fall into these places that happened to offer amazing treatment, but it very easily could have gone the other way. If that comment was just a little bit different, we might not all be here, who knows? Exactly. There's such a stigma about addiction. You might have your next door neighbor might be dealing, be a year ahead and have been dealing with their child with exactly the same problem. And they might have had a great experience at Treatment Center X, but you'll probably never hear about it because there's such a stigma associated, unfortunately, with addiction. And so people don't talk about it. Yeah. Right. Well, and I'll take it a step further, you know, with what's happened with the internet and Google and everything like that, even to try to uh, get new clients, it is such a, like for us, Elevate, we're competing against people with very, very deep pockets in the industry. And unless you can spend 50 to 100 grand a week on uh, (laughs) pay-per-click advertising, you're not even going to show up in the first like three pages. So it's become very difficult for good treatment to even compete against the big dogs who don't even have good treatment. They just have deep pockets. And so it's really cool that you're doing this as a service, as a nonprofit to help the, the little dogs or just the people who are providing good service where otherwise they would never be seen or known or shown. Exactly. You drown it out. It's 200 bucks a year for a treatment center to have a page. I mean, we're not doing this to make money. This is our way to give back to the industry that's saved Karina's lives and my way to help the other families that are coming behind us because unfortunately there's far too many. And, you know, overdoses, I was just looking at, you know, as a result of COVID, overdoses, fatal drug overdoses, for example, that were looking like they were plateauing in 2018 and 2019, they skyrocketed Mm -hmm. again last year. And, um, you know, we know COVID and the isolation and the financial stresses and the lack of recovery supports, all of those- Fentanyl hitting the scene hard. 60% of the over fatal overdoses in um, I think around uh, last summer and fall were a direct result of synthetic opioids like fentanyl. I mean, it's scary. It's so scary out there. And so people need to be able to find the treatment centers that are really providing the best treatment. And that's what I really hope Conquer Addiction can help people do. Yeah, and it, and it totally will. It totally will. It's, it shouldn't be specialized information. It shouldn't be uh, by chance side comment information. I feel like anybody in America knows somebody struggling with addiction and it, it shouldn't be specialized information that just us four hold on to because we happen to have happened to have had an experience of needing treatment or, you know, being in the field. We've, we've been in the field or been in sobriety for, you know, decades, close to a decade. And so thankfully we have this knowledge and this data, but it shouldn't be hidden or so hard to find. So I agree with you on that 1000%. Yeah. Well, and I think it's like what we've talked about, we've sort of hit on is just uh, an industry that got corrupted a few years ago between, you know, the bad rehabs, the the body brokering, the insurance, it's uh, the internet, like it 
kind of got hit hard in every direction. And it actually took out a lot of good mom and pop rehabs where, you know, the only people left standing are the deep pockets or the, the people like us who are just, you know, hanging on, but just trying to deliver great products. So I love that you guys are really sort of showcasing the people that putting in the effort to care about the outcome on the other side. So I would ask if there are uh, any families out there that are listening in and may find that they need treatment again this week or next year, whatever. If they go to Conquer Addiction, again, it's conquer-addiction.org. If they go to Conquer Addiction and they do a search, uh, they will. They may find some some treatment centers in there that meet their criteria that um, you know have proven they have excellent outcomes, like like Elevate has, or you know they may find that we don't know of any treatment centers yet in. Missouri that are tracking their outcomes. Because as I said, well less than 1% of all treatment centers are tracking outcomes. So, but the way we can get that to change is if a, if a, if a person looking for treatment calls the treatment center and they're talking to them, they could say, <clears throat> I don't understand. Why aren't you tracking your outcomes? Why aren't they on conquer addiction? Why aren't you doing that? And I think if admissions counselors hear that a couple of times that they've lost potential business because they weren't doing that, that that's the way the industry is really going to start change from inside is to say, you're right, we really should be tracking our outcomes. Yep. And I love that. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the only thing that matters. <laughs> is the outcome yeah well and especially if you're a parent and you don't know where to send your child you want to go where there's going to be the best outcome you could possibly get you don't, may not get a second chance I mean this is right. a life and death issue yeah you know what I've been surprised about we've done a couple of interviews recently that a lot of programs aren't even programs they, there is, they don't, uh, they don't deliver a program. It's like, come in, go to some meetings or don't, you know, here's your, here's what insurance will pay for. Um, hopefully you'll find a sponsor and, oh, your time is up. All right. You can go now. I've been just like shocked. Like, wait, programs aren't programs. <laughs> There's not a beginning and end. There's not a result. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to get something out of it. You're not trying to get them to a certain point or have them do these certain things to be considered a graduate or dismissed. And I, I just continue to be shocked that they're even allowed to be called a program when they're really just a place to crash because their insurance will pay for it. And they send them on their way after 30 days. It's, it's shocking. That's really me. sad. I mean, and that this is, there has not been a lot of accountability in this industry. Yeah. And that's what, in terms of focusing on what works, what, what is your success rate? What percentage of your patients are in recovery after treatment? By focusing on that, I think we can, over time, continually improve the treatment centers that are there and hopefully get rid of the treatment centers that are like you're describing. They're just really there to make a buck. Make a buck. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. I'm glad that this like a uh, revolution is, is starting. And when you were mentioning kind of like the call to action to the audience or the families to, you know, to ask the harder questions or the questions that matter. I think one of the things that comes up for me too is like, you should ask the questions about the curriculum or the methods that they use to get sober. And if you're getting bombarded with their amenities, maybe you're talking to the wrong place. If they're right. selling you on a hot tub, you might be talking to the wrong treatment <laughs> center, you know? If they're avoiding the outcomes to talk about their hot tubs or the yeah. thread count, you might be talking to the wrong place. 
On the other hand, I will say as a parent that, you know, if I had tried to send Karina, tried to get her to agree to go to a place where, you know, she was going to live in a rinky little basement, she wouldn't have probably agreed to go. So, so there's a part of me that understands. There's a little balance. There's a balance to it. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have the basics amenities <laughs> yeah. you gotta have the basics i will say like the refuge had equine therapy and that was very nice did it help me stay sober yeah no it's I true i have uh, <laughs> some experience with equine therapy and it blew my socks off because i was afraid of the horse I was oh. like, yeah this horse was huge and the, <laughs> the guy that was leading the group the horse bucked up on him and he took this massive boulder and he threw it at the horse's ribs and was like, you have to be in charge. Like, you have to not back down from the horse. Oh, my and God. Horse, no. for the rest of the the horse. Horse. God. I was like, a lot of, lot of layers in the equine therapy. Apparently, <laughs> my goodness. Well, and I, I don't know that this would even make sense to include in the podcast or not. But just to give you, like, before I went to my first treatment center, so shortly after the car accident, um, there was actually two car accidents that, that led up to my first treatment center. So after the first one that we talked about, we tried a IOP program yeah. and it was one that was in Annapolis and it, it, I forget how long I was supposed to be there, six weeks or something like that. But before mm -hmm. the six weeks were over, they ended up shutting down for some reason, but the group was led by this guy. He was probably in his forties, you know, I was like 19 at the time. And right before we closed down, he called me into his office and he was like, you know, I, I just have to ask, do you actually want to get sober? I said, no, I don't want to get sober. <laughs> I, I'm only here because I have to be because my parents are making me. He's like, that's what I thought. And he ended up um, buying me alcohol and getting me high and taking me out on two different occasions. And it was actually the alcohol that he bought for me that enabled me to get into my second car accident. Um, but he was, you know, grooming me to, you know, yeah. to date me or whatever. But I mean, and I was fine with that because he was giving me drugs and alcohol. But, you know, this was someone that was supposed to be my drug and alcohol counselor. This is someone that was getting paid to help keep me sober. And, you know, he actively, um, you know, actively aided my addiction. And um, I think that that's pro hopefully rare, but that was my very first experience in the drug and alcohol field. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that that was your first experience. What a bummer. It's, you know, it's, I, I would agree that it's rare, you know, but it's kind of like, humans are humans you know and they they do that in all fields and all spaces and it, it it hurts a little bit more when you know you're in this this power position or you're like being looked up to like a teacher or a doctor or a counselor or a therapist it, it's far more frowned upon when you already have this like i'm above you you need to listen to what i say get your life together because i know it just sits way worse. Oh, it's it's like the cardinal sin of, of drug treatment is, you know, you're not dealing with somebody who's well and you're taking advantage of them. And it's, uh, that's, that's horrific. I mean, I can only imagine that created some trust issues with you and rehab after that. Like you said, what's the point, you know, if I'm just going to go from this situation to being enabled in another situation or taken advantage of, I, I bet that created some trust issues there for sure. I'm sure it did. But anyways, so, I'm incredibly grateful for the great work that you guys are doing and all of the lives that you're saving because obviously, you know, this is very personal to you. This is very personal to my mother and I. And, you know, the, I, I truly believe without a fathom of a doubt that had I not had the incredible experiences at the treatment centers that I went to, that I wouldn't be alive today. And, um, you know, life is, life is so beautiful and having the opportunity to to put my hand out there and to help others along the way has really been one of the greatest gifts of this program and one of the greatest gifts of sobriety, but to continue the work that you guys are doing on the front lines day in and day out. Thank you for everything that you're doing and all the lives that, that you're saving because they deserve to be saved and yeah, I'm grateful for it. Me too. Thank you. And thank you too for doing what you guys do out there. Like I said, you know, if it wasn't for you, 
we were looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars by colleges and years and years of outcomes. And uh, you guys made it very easy for us to step in and get the get the the studies that we needed and wanted and the tools that we need. I mean, we've it's given us amazing like management tools where we're like, okay, so the people that do really good in the 30 day, most likely alcohol, but we've noticed that the people that do the longer program, they, they're the harder drugs and that totally makes sense. And it's really helped us uh, give us tools to continue to run a better program and, and, and move and adjust to meet the needs of our clients, which I think is so important for all rehabs. So thank you guys for doing what you do. And also that safety net, like, thank gosh, you guys are out there calling our graduates or, and every other programs graduates and checking in with them. And maybe they trust you and they're telling you a little more like, like that mom, that guy you talked to that was in the club, like, yeah, have them call me. You know, if you hadn't made that call, you, you, you saved a life right there. Like, and that's so cool because you guys are doing that for very little pay, just on purpose and heart. And we appreciate you guys out there uh, fighting this fight with us as well. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah, I think together we're uh, the A team. The dream, the dream team. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I'll make sure to, when we post the episode, to include, you know, Vista Research and Conquer Addiction and, and all that jazz. I guess, is there anything else you wanted our audience to know about Vista Research, about Conquer Addiction? Is there anywhere else for them to find you guys? I'm not sure if you guys have like Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. No, we've been talking about starting an Instagram page. We we have a Facebook page, but we haven't spent a lot of time on it. So that's okay. You know. I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, we just gotta go to our website for now. Hey, tried and true method. 